Thank you for joining us today for another Qigong coaching clinic. Sorry about taking a couple of minutes to get it started because I had a little bit of technical difficulty, but here we are and I am really thrilled to see you. I know that there may be some great things that you could be doing on Saturday morning or afternoon if you're on the East Coast or any time of the day, wherever you are in, in the world, but this is an important experience because you probably feel like you want to improve the quality of your life by the, improving the quality of your postural alignment. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. So how are we going to improve our postural alignment? And what can we do to make it work better for us? Well, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? There are lots of things that we can do, but the most important thing is we can improve our postural alignment by finding the optimal alignment. What's the difference between a good posture and optimal? Well, if you have any ideas, any answers to this question, you're definitely welcome to chime in. I'll raise your hand if you uh, need me to address some of the issues that you may have with your postural alignment. But essentially what we're gonna be doing is uh, exploring uh, what it means to find optimal alignment. Well, optimal alignment is not the same as good posture. Why? Because most people don't know what the good posture is. And so when they tell us what the good posture is according to their idea, usually it's not the most optimal posture for us. So what am I gonna do here today? Am I gonna tell you what the good posture is gonna be for you? No. I'm going to help you discover the optimal alignment for yourself. And by doing that, you will also discover for yourself that you have the power to improve your posture alignment by developing greater body awareness. What's body awareness? Well, it's the awareness of your physical body. When you pay attention to your physical body, you can actually learn a great deal about it. There is no way to learn about things you pay no attention to, right? And when you develop awareness of your physical body, something also really important happens. Where attention goes, energy flows. So you actually facilitate a greater flow of energy circulating in your own system. And by doing that, obviously you creating an ability to experience greater vitality, greater sense of well-being, and even find what it's like to be in a flow. And by being in a flow, I mean feeling the flow of energy in or around your body and learning how to align with that flow so that you experience the state of being in the flow. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you just surrender completely and go wherever the wind blows. Why is that? Well, because sometimes you may also have some dreams and aspirations that are not exactly in the same direction where the flow is going. So you may be able to navigate the flow in such a way that you can still be in the flow or at least not struggle against it. And at the same time, achieve what you want to achieve or manifest the dreams that you want to manifest. And this is a really neat way to look at uh, the whole energy dynamics in Qigong. Being in the flow is like the holy grail of Qigong, but how do we achieve that? And what do we get when we achieve that? Well, we achieve it by paying attention to how the energy flows in our body. And we, what do we get out of it? We get out of it the ability to experience the most profound sense of well-being and wellness. And we also develop the ability to perform things uh, such as self-healing miracles or helping other people heal or other types of feats of power and uh, a city as they call them in Sanskrit. 
the abilities to achieve things that for other people seem to be difficult or impossible. Well, that's also what we call mastery. Mastery basically boils down to being able to do things that other people find difficult or impossible. And when you develop that ability to do such things with relative ease, you become even more masterful. So what we're learning is how to become masterful about ourselves, first and foremost. And we start with the body alignment. Let's master our alignment of our physical body by simply learning how to assess what works and what doesn't work. So I'm going to turn in this direction. Don't mind this bright yellow wall behind me because, well, that's uh, the oddest color that we could find. And sure enough, we painted the wall in an oddest color. And I'm going to demonstrate what I call the natural stance. Natural stance is what happens to your body when you just simply jump and land softly like this. It doesn't have to be a very high jump. It doesn't have to be uh, an effortful jump. It's a relatively effortless jump. To make this jump even more effortless, I suggest using the power of your arms to help your legs, just like this. So your arms begin the movement upwards and kind of create an uplifting movement that helps you take off. The direction of the palms also makes a difference. Just to humor me, you can try taking off by turning the palms downwards. The center of the palm is a major energy point or gateway in the body called La Gong. La Gong points are beaming energy from the center of the palm perpendicular to the surface. So if you are turning the palms upwards, does it make it easier to take off or jump? It certainly does. When you turn the palms downwards, it makes it a little bit harder and also the landing becomes a little bit harsher. It feels a little heavier almost. So this is an anatomical position of arms, but I'm not gonna tell you that you have to stand or walk around with your palms perfectly this way because it may feel uncomfortable or just weird. And we need to learn to find out what works best for you. Ideally, you would have a practice partner who would help you by testing. And what we're testing for is maximum stability or ability to withstand pressure. So the testing would literally consist of somebody pushing you or trying to push you. When someone tries to push you and you are not easily pushed over, that is a pretty clear indication that you are stable. When somebody pushes you with the same strength or the same level of pressure and that you can easily get pushed over, well, then it's not a sign of strength. That's a sign of weakness or instability. So we learn how to recognize that stability or instability often depend on how we align different parts of the body, including those parts of the body that don't seem to affect our stability. For example, our arms and hands. It seems counterintuitive that just turning the palms this way makes you stand stronger. Don't take me out of my work. Try it, test it experiment with it so that you find out for yourself if that's true. I don't want you to just ind get indoctrinated by me. I'm not a cult leader. I don't want to just download the information into your brains. I want you to experience it firsthand on your own skin, so to speak. So ask somebody to serve as your practice partner. And once we're done uh, doing our clinic, obviously, you may have some friends, relatives, neighbors, kids. <laughs> so you can ask them to push you. But they need to push you with a very specific type of push so that they wouldn't be using force. They would be using power to push. How do you tap into power so that you don't have to use force? Well, it's actually a lot easier than it seems. For most people, 
the idea of pushing consists of just shoving with the hand while standing more or less static. What I'm talking about is actually touching the surface that you're trying to push, for example, a person's body, and then lifting the front foot. That's right. It's the foot that's already carrying a little bit more than 50% of your weight. It's a weight-bearing foot. However, you can still lift it like this. When you lift the foot, you no longer have support on that side of your body. So you will start falling in that direction and the gravity will do all the work. That means that you do not have to use physical force to push. You just simply lift the foot and your hand will lean onto the body of the person you are testing. Well, obviously if somebody is testing you, they will be leaning onto your body and it will be a repeatable, duplicable test that is done with the same level of pressure because the gravity is doing all the work and the g-force stays more or less the same. That makes this test much more reliable than the stereotypical muscle testing that some of you may be familiar with. And it also doesn't isolate any particular muscle, it actually works on the whole body. We want to be able to test the stability and balance of the entire structure. So what we do is we simply test by applying this uh, testing push that has no force behind it, pure power. As a matter of fact, it's a very profound philosophical, I would even say ontological consideration. By learning how to push with power rather than force, you can learn or you can teach your friends or practice partners how to become powerful rather than forceful. Now that's a pretty powerful way to be. Learning how to be powerful rather than forceful can transform virtually every aspect of your life. Seriously, would you like to be a powerful healer or a forceful healer? Or would you like to be, like to be a powerful businessman or a forceful businessman? Or even a parent, would you like to be a powerful parent or a forceful one? Even in martial arts. Would you like to be a powerful martial artist or a forceful martial artist? See, this juxtaposition, when you put it this way, is so obvious that most people, of course, would say, yeah, I want to be a powerful one. Who wants to be a forceful parent or a forceful healer, right? Well, what we learn is how to develop the ability to embody this principle, not just talk the talk, but actually walk the talk or physically manifest the ability to use power instead of force. Now, once we figured out how to test, we can go through a battery of tests. The alignment of the arms is just one of many ways of looking at body alignments. What else can we align? Well, by the way, the alignments of the arms doesn't have to be perfectly palms forward. It can be at some different angle. So you're welcome to test different angles to find out what works best for you, because what works for you may not be the same as what works for the next person. And that means that each person can find the authentic and most optimal alignment of arms for him or her. The same applies to the alignment of the legs. A lot of Tai Chi and Qigong teachers tell their students to stand with their feet shoulder width apart toes parallel to each other or pointing directly forward, like they're on skis. Yeah, when you're on skis, I totally agree. <laughs> it's a great idea to keep your feet parallel to each other because otherwise your skis are gonna go uh, in two different directions, not good. But when you're not on skis, which I think you spend 99.999% of your time, <laughs> you don't need to put your feet parallel to each other. As a matter of fact, you're welcome to test. Again, the same push test can be used also to check whether or not standing with the feet parallel to each other or at some different angle would be more beneficial. So I don't want to rule out the possibility that for somebody somewhere on the outskirts of this galaxy, it may actually work best. 
For most human beings, it doesn't. Why? Because it forces the distribution of weight on the lateral sides of the feet, on the outside, on the outer edges of the feet. Why does that happen? Well, because for most people, especially if they try to follow what they call the principles of Wuji stance, you know, the knees are supposed to be on top of the feet. Well, if the knees on top of the feet and the feet are parallel to each other, the bones of the upper leg, lower leg, and the feet are not going to be in, in the same geometrical plane. In other words, they're not going to be in alignment. Well, what would be the benefit of not having bones in the line? I honestly don't see any, <laughs> because when the bones are not in alignment, they can't perform their function very well. So what we we'll do is we learn how to align the bones. And in order to achieve that, once again, we jump and land softly, like this. And I'm quite certain that your feet are not going to be parallel once you land. Why? Because your body will want to land with maximum stability, so it doesn't fall over. And so the body uh, it will naturally position your feet in such a way that they would provide a maximum stability. If the maximum stability were to be with feet parallel to each other, you would land that way. If you didn't land quite that way, well, let's check what's the angle between the feet. Just like the position of the arms, for each person is gonna be different and unique. It also depends on your holding patterns. We will be looking into those in just a few minutes. And depending on your holding patterns, depending on the tensions in your glutes or in your groin or knee or ankles or other parts of the body, the alignment of the legs will need to be specific to compensate for those tensions and to provide you maximum stability. Once you allow your body to express its desire to be stable, it will appreciate that. You often will feel, oh my God, it's a lot easier to breathe. You may have a sigh of relief or start yawning. And guess what? Yawning and sighing are perfectly okay. It's the sign that your body is relaxing. Why is your body relaxing? Because your central nervous system recognizes it doesn't have to send so many signals of contraction to your skeletal muscles. And when the central nervous system becomes less agitated and sends fewer signals of contraction to your muscles throughout the body, that includes your breathing muscle, your diaphragm. When your diaphragm doesn't receive so many signals of contraction, what does it do? It relaxes. And that is exactly why you would have a sigh of relief, or at least notice how your breathing becomes deeper and smoother. That is the gauge of how well you resonate with something. If you don't have a practice partner, if you don't have somebody to test you by pushing you, you can still experience some degree of self-assessment. You may not be able to assess yourself as perfectly as you would be able to with the help of another person because it's gonna be more subjective, obviously. However, you can still use certain gauges to provide you the feedback that allows you to assess how much you are in alignment, how well you are in flow. What would be those gauges? One of the most important gauges is the breath. Now, a lot of Qigong and Tai Chi teachers tell their students, you need to breathe deep. You need to breathe like this. You know, they provide certain techniques or certain breathing exercises. That's nice, but it actually messes with the gauge. <laughs> That's right. I'm not against breathing exercises. I do them myself, but they need to be done after you've established a clear a way of reading biofeedback from your whole body by using this gauge, using the breath as the system of biofeedback mechanism. And that's exactly what breath does for each and every one of us all the time. 
if we don't pay attention to it, we don't appreciate it for such uh, feedback. And we try to correct it because, well, we may not think that it's doing something right. But the body actually breathes the way that it can, given the circumstances, given the way that you're holding yourself, the way you're exerting your energy, the way that you are feeling emotionally or otherwise. If you pay attention to your breath, you may actually learn about certain processes happening in your body. And instead of manipulating breath, you constantly keep checking with it. What if I do this? Does it change the way that I feel? Does it have an effect on my breath? What if I stand like that? Does it change the way that my breathing works? And essentially what you develop is the sense of appreciation of your breath. And instead of meditating on counting your breaths or you know breathing for this length of time, breathing in, or holding the breath, breathing out, that's really not what I would recommend. What I would recommend is developing the awareness of how you breathe and then noticing the ease of breathing that happens when you are in the flow or when you are experiencing more optimal alignment of your body, more optimal performance, more optimal mental states. In other words, the breathing is going to tell you a lot about yourself that perhaps you wouldn't know otherwise. Now, that's really brilliant, isn't it? You can develop the ability to feel yourself from inside that most people never do. This is what we also refer to as the sixth sense. Now, some people might call it gut feeling. We may call it breathing feeling. But there is a wonderful term for it, kinesthesia. Kinesthesia is the ability to feel movement, subtle movements, big movements, small movements. Obviously, each and every breath is the movement. Even movements like blood pumping or a flow of peristalsis in your digestive tract, subtle contractions and relaxations of uh, muscles uh, that provide you support called stabilizers. Most people never pay attention to this type of things because they just don't pay enough attention to themselves. So in a sense, what we're learning is how to develop this quality of attention that most people never experience in their lives, especially in the context of modern lifestyle where it's often considered rude or just uh, uh, not conscientious to pay attention to yourself. It's almost like, oh no, you don't wanna become a narcissist. And I say, this is not the way to become a narcissist. This is the way to become conscious of yourself and developing self-awareness gives you self-knowledge. There's only one way to gain knowledge of anything is by paying attention to that which you want to know about. If you want to know about yourself, which is basically the primary objective of most schools of personal and spiritual development, as far as I know, well, you need to pay attention to yourself. And by paying attention to yourself, you also facilitate that massive circulation of energy within your own system that we just mentioned a few minutes ago. So I'm going to be switching gears a little bit and exploring holding patterns that I promise to explore in my email announcement. But before we do that, let me ask you if anyone has any questions, comments, feel free to raise your hand. In order to raise your hand, you simply go to participants, I think. Um, let's see, how do you raise your hand? I think you go to the participants or more. And then there must be a way to raise your hand. If anyone knows how to raise your hand, please raise your hand. If no one knows how to raise your hand, well, then I guess nobody will have any questions. Oh. Mama, this is Elena. You just go to participants and it's very clear. There's an icon with the raised hand and the words beside it say raise hand. Thank you, Elena. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I can't see it because as a presenter, I don't have the option to raise my own hand. 
<laughs> so I clicked on participants and I'm like, where is the raised hand? I know that it's supposed to be here. I don't see it for some reason. Yeah, it's so, a blue hand on the left and it says right. raised hand right beside it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, so this is how we raise the hand. Oh, I see Jacqueline raise the hand. So feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Jackie, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Still can't hear you. I don't know why I can't hear you. Huh? No, you're still muted. Jackie, you're still muted. On the left bottom corner of the screen, the, there is a mute button. Ah, no, it still doesn't do it. Weird. Um, I don't know how to make it work for you, Jackie. There's a, obviously a lot of issues. Well, I see Brenda lift, uh, raised her hand. Yes. That's if you work go you. Uh, on the bottom of your screen where participants is, it, yeah. it's under reactions. Slide your cursor over to reactions. And that's where you'll find the raised hands, the heart, the clap, all of those functions. Right. Where it says next to record, there's a word that says reactions. And Excellent. if you click on that, you'll see all the different things you can do. Thumbs up. Very, very nice. Thank there's you so the much. Answer. Okay. Now, do you have any question for me uh, in, in regard to optimal alignment of the body or anything else that we were talking about? No, I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> I love the practice. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Brenda. I see Lucinda raised the hand. Feel free to uh, unmute yourself, Lucinda. Hi, I've just arrived. Could you tell me how long you've been running, please, and what I've missed? <laughs> we started about half a year, an hour ago, and uh, uh, yeah. uh, it's all recorded, so not to okay. worry. I will also send out an email with a link to the recording of it. It's going to be uh, either on my YouTube channel or Facebook or both. Thank you so much. But if it's you have any questions in regard to your own breathing or practices of Qigong, uh, breathing, meditation, Tai Chi, or anything related, feel free to ask me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, I have a question always about, um, I've just bought a book called Breathing Cure, The Breathing Cure by somebody called Patrick McCure, and a huge, great book, very, very interesting, based on the Botenko breathing, sort of broadly speaking. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not familiar with the book, but I know about breathing. Good. Okay. Well, <laughs> of course you do. What I'm really interested in is to quieten my breathing um, gently, you know, not in an, a forced way, so that my mind can be, begin to quieten down. Ah, that's the question of the chicken or the egg. Exactly. What comes first? The yep. quiet breathing or quiet mind? Well, I solved the question of the chicken and egg a long time ago by recognizing that before even birds evolved, the reptiles were laying eggs. So guess what? The eggs are coming first and the chickens come second. The same about breath versus state of mind. So if you are in a stressed or worried state of mind, the breath will reflect that. If you are in a peaceful or focused state of mind, the breath will reflect that too. Breath is like a, a biofeedback mechanism. Now, of course, we can mess with the mechanism. It's just like driving a car and looking at the speedometer to check how fast you're going. And then you realize, oh no, I shouldn't be going more than 50 miles an hour or you know, 100 kilometers an hour or whatever speed you're supposed to be living, it's, it's traveling below. And you're like, hmm, well, where is my screwdriver? And you start adjusting the speedometer so that it will show you the speed that you should be traveling at. Now, that's what people end up doing when they try to mess with a biofeedback mechanism called breathing. They basically are trying to affect the mind through breath. 
Now, I don't want to say that there is no uh, back and forth communication between the systems. Of course there is. Is it easier? Well, for some people, it may be easier. So they use the body-mind approach. In Tibetan medicine, it's by and large considered stereotypical or, or standard operating procedure that the mental processes are the root cause of most of our health issues. So what we do then is we address the mental state first in order to try to quiet the breathing in order to quiet the mind. We actually go straight to the cause, quiet the mind, and then check with the breathing. Did it work? So in a sense, it's a more direct and at the same time also more elegant approach because we're not trying to force the body to do something right. Let me explain. If your body is stifled or um, less than, uh, if, if your breathing is stifled, it's because of the tension. Mm. Now, if the mind is still irritated and sends the signals of contraction to the muscles that caused the stifled breathing in the first place, but then you try to correct the breathing so that it would be right. Well, you can achieve that, but you have to counteract that tension with something. What would you use to counteract that tension with? Some other tension. Basically, you end up with twice as much tension as a result. That doesn't sound like the most optimal way to handle the situation, does it? <laughs> there is no signal of, of relaxation that central nervous system can send to the muscles, so you cannot counteract it with relaxation. Some people would say, oh, I just, send a signal of relaxation. Sorry, there is no such physiological process. There is no signal of relaxation. There are only more signals of contraction or fewer signals of contraction. So we basically end up counteracting original tension with some additional secondary tension, adding insult to injury, so to speak. That's one of the reasons why so many people in China and other countries where some folks are really gun ho about doing Qigong according to what the master has told them. They take it religiously, I guess. They end up with what they call qi deviations. It's a very prevalent issue among Qigong practitioners in those parts of the world because they're doing exactly that. They are trying to counteract the issue that they had with breathing by correcting the breathing but the only way they achieve that is actually by tensing up more or forcing the breath to do what they think is right. And how much do we really know what's right? We only know this little about what we really get to know about ourselves, right? It's like what we know about ourselves and life and world around us is probably fair to say that's like a tip of the iceberg as compared to what we don't know about ourselves or life. If that's true, then we don't really know that much. And trying to impose our assumed ideas of what is right on the body sometimes may work, but sometimes may not work, rather than taking this nebulous and often faulty approach. We actually learn how to let the body do its thing, and we communicate with the body by using this biofeedback mechanism that we call breathing. Does it make sense to you, Lucinda? Absolutely, yes, I'm right with you. Thank you. You're so welcome. All right, uh, let's see, uh, Richie, you raise your hand. You have a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you again, Lama Tantrapa, for holding this container and sharing all of this information. Absolutely. Um, my question is related specifically to the natural stance before when there was the standing jump. Are there any uh, recommendations or ideas as far as a natural seated posture or a way to be in a chair in a more natural way without maybe jumping out of the chair or something? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's a really good question. And I appreciate you brought it up because most of us right now are seating. And unfortunately, sedentary lifestyle is ubiquitous in modern a way of living, isn't it? So how do we develop a more appropriate or more optimal way to sit? Well, first of all, let's figure out how to sit down. 
I'm going to demonstrate my way of sitting down. And it may be different from the way that you normally sit down. So we can also play with that. Let's see. I put my feet as close to the seat that I'm going to sit down. So my heels are pretty much either touching uh, the chair, armchair, couch, or whatever I'm going to land on. And then I start extending my arms forward. It's almost like standing meditation. But at the same time, I start squatting. No need to keep the torso upright. In this case, it's OK to tilt the torso slightly forward. And notice how slowly I'm moving. Now I'm hovering about an inch, maybe even half an inch above the seat. I'm not sitting. I'm just squatting basically in a, in a chair uh, yoga position. And then as I feel like, OK, yeah, I feel like I can land softly and comfortably and safely. Yeah, I will land with my buttocks on the seat. If I want to stand up, the same process in reverse. I extend my arms forward, lean forward with my torso. Notice my palms, by the way. It's almost like I'm holding something precious. The palms are not facing down. That's going to make you standing up harder or more difficult. It's almost like you, you're being pulled upwards by the fingertips. Beautiful. Yeah, easy, effortless way to stand up. Easy and effortless way to sit down. Again, as you sit down, give yourself a pause for just a few seconds before plopping with your butt on the chair or arm, armchair. That's right. So your legs will actually need to get stronger. And they will get stronger as you keep doing this movement. How many times do we sit down or stand up every day? If we counted, probably it would be dozens, if not hundreds of times. So I'm really glad that you brought it up, Richard. It's a, a great question. Now, one more uh, point of uh, interest is, are feet supposed to be parallel to each other like we talked about or slightly spread out? Personally, I find that natural stance works best for me under almost all circumstances, including in the process of standing up or sitting down. I know where my feet belong when I jump and land, so I place them in more or less the same position. It means when my knees start bending, they don't point directly forward. No, sir. They point slightly outwards because my toes point slightly up. If I glance down, I can see that my knees and toes are pointing in more or less the same direction on both right and left sides. That means that the bones of my upper legs, lower legs, and feet are pretty much in alignment or in the same geometrical planes. They are not the same for the right leg and for the left leg, but that's okay. They are going to be in alignment, and then that means that the joints are not going to be compromised. The muscles will not have to compensate for structural misalignment of the bones. That means that muscle do only what they need to do in order to perform this maneuver. And that means they're not overtaxed. They're relatively comfortable. And the last but not the least consideration is how far back do you want to land with your butt? I suggest learning how to land on the edge of your chair first because you will not need to lean as much forward with your torso. If you want to land further back in the chair or armchair, you will have to lean forward a lot further so that the butt sticks out for the back. <laughs> now, landing on the edge of the seat is also gonna keep you in a better, um, more streamlined alignment in general. So, Basically, there are a lot of pros and very few cons to being on the edge of your seat. Now, there is an English expression that something or someone yeah. puts you on the edge of your seat. What does it mean? 
Any ideas? People are engaged or riveted. Yeah, can you speak up a little bit, Richie? Uh, yes, edge of the seat usually means people are engaged or riveted. They're very much following or captivated by the experience. Yes, they're paying attention. And that's exactly what we're learning. We're learning how to develop greater attentiveness. There is the principle of mindfulness that we want to also exercise in our lives, don't we? A lot of people talk about mindfulness these days. It's a big buzzword. But how do we develop it? Well, this is one of the easiest ways to develop it. Be on the edge of your seat most of the time. If you are on the edge of your seat, you are paying attention. If you are really slumbered and, and relaxed, yeah, you're kind of not really paying attention. Would you want to attend my webinar if I am like this? It would probably be like, what is this guy doing? He's too relaxed. <laughs> He's about to fall asleep. I don't want to fall asleep on you. I want to help you awake too. And how do I help you awaken? By being the role model of being awake. So I have to be on the edge of my seat and help you become on the edge of your seat, paying attention, being mindful, developing greater awareness of your body, greater awareness and energy, and eventually becoming more in the flow. Did I answer your question, Richie? Yes, it did. Thank you again. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. Very good questions. I appreciate them. And let's see how we can take a look at some of the holding patterns, because there are, there are holding patterns that all of us have. As, much, as long as you have a personality, <laughs> you have some holding pattern. Basically, holding patterns are physical manifestations of your personality. Or it would be even more fair to say the physical manifestations of your identity. Now, what's the difference between identity and personality? Well, personality comes from the word persona. And that actually is based on, believe it or not, ancient Greek theater where the actors apparently were not very good actors. So they couldn't really portray their emotions that well. So they would wear masks. You know, they would wear smiling masks if it was a comedy and give the viewers a clue that it's time to laugh. Or they would wear a sad mask if it was a tragedy. Well, unfortunately, um, we continue wearing these masks nowadays, even though we're not actors in ancient Greek theater. These masks are not just facial expressions, they are holding patterns in our bodies. They reflect back to us how we feel. They demonstrate to other people how we want them to perceive us. And the uh, expression, uh, the, the body language expression of who you are is basically so ingrained in your identity, you identify with it. You basically feel like this is who I am. So if somebody said, well, have you ever considered wearing your arms at a different angle instead of this way, for example, maybe that way? And you'd be like, ah, oh, this is really weird. I don't feel like doing this because I've never done it. Well, if you haven't done something, it doesn't mean that you should try. As a matter of fact, we all have done this. What do I mean by that? When we were children, we were all feeling much more natural in our bodies. As a, like, look at any child that's just learning how to walk and maybe just, you know, one or two year old. The toddlers often walk around with their palms this way. They look kind of goofy, they look childish. They are actually constantly learning, constantly soaking in information. They don't want to be childish. They are observing others around them. And if they notice that their siblings, their parents, the other people around them wear their arms this way, palms backwards, that's what they learn to do. So by the age of four, maybe five or six years of age, most children stop wearing arms this way because they would feel inadequate or 
goofy and, and they don't want to feel un, unaccepted. They want to be accepted. They want to be acknowledged and, uh, and appreciated by others. So as a child, unconsciously, each and every one of us learn how to pretend to be somebody who we are not by basically adjusting our physical posture alignments or developing certain misalignments. By the age of seven or eight, that becomes so prevalent that you would have a hard time getting the kid to actually revert back to their uh, original, more innocent way of being. And of course, from that point on, throughout teenage years and adulthood, it becomes more solidified, more ingrained. And basically, most adults would say, well, this was a really goofy way to walk around. I feel like a little child. Well, what's wrong with that? You're learning how to be natural again. <laughs> because what you've learned until now was basically how to be accepted by other humans. And once we realize that other humans are by and large dysfunctional, we realize that being a, a well adjusted to dysfunctional human society is not a sign of health. Hmm. Well, so what we're learning is essentially undoing a lot of domestication that has been done to us. And by doing that, we discover a much more optimal, much more natural and healthy way of being. So that is what I in, invite you and implore you to discover for yourself. And I will do everything I can to help you if you want my help. So let's take a look at a few holding patterns. In our previous clinic, we talked a little bit about some of the holding patterns. I introduced holding out pattern. I, I talked about holding in pattern. In and out are basically not completely opposite to each other. Paradoxically enough, holding in pattern is like you hold in like you tense all over. Like if you see me, for example, going from this more or less relaxed way of being to this, would you say that there's something going on with me? Not that I just need to pee and holding it in, which may be one of the reasons why people do it to themselves. But there may also be certain emotional state. What kind of emotional state would that be if the person does this? And you don't see my legs, but trust me, something funny is going on with my legs when I do it. My knees invert or go inwards. And that is achieved by tensing up. Tensing up not only the groin muscles that turn the knees in, the um, distribution of weight also shifts towards the medial edges of the feet, which obviously creates tension on peroneus muscles uh, on the lateral sides of the lower legs. There's going to be tension in the um, muscle that most people don't know much about. This is an abdominus muscle called transversus abdominis. Now, it sounds very similar to its brother, rectus abdominis, but they go in two different directions. Rectus abdominis goes up and down, connecting the sternum to the pubic bone. Transversus abdominis goes along the belt line, and it is the core muscle, unlike the rectus abdominis, which is not a core muscle. So whenever somebody says, well, you need to work on your core, you need to train your abs, well, you probably need to ask him, which exactly abs are you talking about? Transversus abdominis or rectus abdominis? Most people confuse those two. So they think that the rectus abdominis is a core muscle, which it isn't. Transversus abdominis is the core muscle and it often will be tense. The rectus abdominis can become tense too when you're holding in. Where else are you gonna have tension? trapezius, especially upper traps. It's like that muscle that kind of lifts your shoulders up to, towards the ears. Yes, exactly like that. That often becomes so ingrained or so stereotypical that the person has really hard time dropping their shoulders because there's chronic tension. Have you ever met anyone like that? Well, it's associated with a state of fear it may be unconscious fear, so the person would not even say what they're afraid of if you ask them. They may even say, I'm not afraid of anything. What makes you think I'm afraid? 
And you may say, well, you look kind of freaked out. Oh no, I'm really cool. Well, that's not the way people are usually cool. <laughs> but what we do is we learn how to recognize that in other people first. And then we turn the tables on ourselves. We literally start noticing where am I doing it to myself? Isn't that kind of interesting? It's easier to notice all these idiosyncrasies in other people and point the finger at them and say, oh, look at that guy. He looks like he's freaked out. Or look at that girl. She looks like she's really cool. Well, that's fine. We learn how to recognize these holding patterns in others. And then we need to actually start paying into ourself, attention to ourselves, noticing this or similar holding patterns within our own bodies. Once we develop the ability to notice these holding patterns within ourselves, something really amazing is going to happen. You will be conscious of that which used to be unconscious. All of these holding patterns, by and large, are completely unconscious in most people. Who in the right mind would hold tension consciously like this? Because it makes it really hard to breathe. It makes it really hard to function. If you're an athlete, your athletic performances will suck. If you are a martial artist, you probably will be too afraid to even engage in any kind of martial arts. <laughs> if you are um, uh, a parent, you probably are giving your children a really terrible uh, role model of how to be. Basically, there are no, no pros, very many cons and very few pros in being this way. It's not completely without pros because sometimes you can use these holding patterns as survival mechanisms. As a matter of fact, perhaps some of these holding patterns developed in our childhood or maybe teenage years as survival mechanisms. They allowed us to survive. Maybe you were bullied at school, for example, and you wanted to become a really small target so that you wouldn't be so easily noticed by the bullies. Well, yeah, it makes sense. Then you want to shrink. You want to become tiny. You want to be invisible. And that uh, is one of the reasons why people end up with a holding in pattern. Basically, it became so prevalent as a state of mind that it became habituated. That fear or that um, attempt to become small target. So if you are in a situation where you need to become a small target, say in, in the war. <laughs> Maybe it's okay to become a small target temporarily. Just don't get stuck in this perspective. Being stuck in fear, there is nothing glorious about it. And no war has ever been won by those who were stuck in a holding pattern like this. However, it may allow you to survive under some circumstances. Great, once you survive, it doesn't mean that you should be that way for the rest of your life. And unfortunately, that's what most of us end up doing. Same thing, for example, with the holding out pattern. Like I said, it's not completely opposite of holding in because one side is holding in more than the other. Basically, holding out pattern looks kind of like this. I'm kind of striking a pose. Any teenager knows how to strike a pose. As teenagers, we probably learn how to be like this kind of cool and maybe even expressing some degree of um, independence and maybe not buying into some bullshit that has been shoved down our throats. We may even you know, want to be like a little aloof or um, maybe skeptical of things. So this is a perfect expression of skepticism. You strike a pose like this and you immediately telegraph to other people that you are not necessarily buying whatever stuff they're offering to you. Now, I know this because, for example, I communicate with hundreds of people uh, who I invite to become my coaching clients. Not everyone becomes my coaching client. How do I know ahead of time whether or not the person is going to say yay or nay to working with me? <laughs> One of the telltales is this, the person strikes a pose. Um, yeah, that's kind of cool what you're talking about, but I don't know, maybe I need to think about it. Well, 
if a person tells me that they need to think about it, that usually means that they're going to just simply say they're not going to do it. Not that they really think through, because if they think through it, they would realize that what I'm offering to them is like a life-saving service. But not everybody is ready to commit to saving their own life or to improve the quality of their life. So I can often detect that the person is in that kind of non-committal state of mind when they're striking a pose, holding out, shifting more weight on one foot, less weight on the other foot. Now, if that is done in the context of a conversation or, uh, or some other similar dynamics where you basically express your independence and want to stay kind of cool and maybe aloof, that's understandable. Just don't get stuck in that perspective. <laughs> you may be able to express your independence momentarily, but you don't have to be constantly stuck in that way of proving to everyone that you are independent and you are really cool and, and you are um, trying to uh, blaze your own trail because it gets old. Not only it gets old to other people to see you that way, but it also makes your body old because it takes a lot of energy to be that way. And what we do is we realize that holding patterns are not really a, a great way to be all the time. We can use them under some circumstances. We can use them as tools, but don't just get stuck with one tool because it's, as they say, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you'll treat everything as a nail. <laughs> so you basically will be reacting to everything that life has to offer to you in the same habitual manner. And what we're learning is how to become much more broad, much broader in our responses to life and be more open to what life has to offer. This opening to life happens when we discover that we don't have to be in the same way, in the same state of mind, in the same holding pattern all the time. And by experimenting with different holding patterns, you give yourself permission to shift from one to another. So in a sense, experimenting with holding patterns actually enables your body to learn that there are more ways to be than one habitual one. So what other holding patterns do we know? Well, there are many uh, secondary holding patterns the ones that may be mixing, let's say holding forth and holding up or holding in and holding down or various other combinations. But the primary holding patterns basically are six, up, down, back and forth, in and out, simple. <laughs> in medical terminology, there would be directions like superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, exterior, and interior. All these directions, by the way, in Chinese medicine and Tibetan medicine also are addressed in the same way. And they also have certain characteristics. And you may be surprised to discover that some characteristics are obvious, some characteristics are not so obvious. For example, yin and yang associations. Yeah, upwards, anterior direct, if, uh, superior direction is obviously yang, inferior direction is obviously yin. So up, young, down, yet. Simple, there is nothing to think about. However, when you think about back and forth, there's a paradox. Back is young, forth or forward is yin. Why is that? Well, we look at the way that energy circulates through the body. And in particular, the governing and conception vessels. And conception vessel, that flows down the front of the body, so-called center line, flows downwards. And governing vessel that flows up along the spine, up over the top of the head, flows upwards. So back of the body is actually yang and front of the body is yin. Back is usually strong and more solid. The front is more soft underbelly, so to speak. Ah, so, now we begin to kind of understand the forward direction is yin and backwards is yang. Now with up and down, that was pretty clear. We figured back and forth. 
there is one more couple of directions out and in. Out is yang, in is yin. Pretty self explanatory. So then we can talk about yin directions like holding in, yang directions like holding out. Now, up and down. Holding up is something that you may say uh, may be associated with being really kind of self confident. And people think that this is good posture. Maybe self important. Maybe even uh, a little bit uh, arrogant. Well, a little bit arrogant or a great deal arrogant. <laughs> it's just the degrees of, uh, of perspective. But basically, lordosis comes from this holding pattern. What's lordosis? It's the sway back. It's being like a lord. Well, lords, by and large, especially in Great Britain, where there is a uh, house of lords, the, they're pretty important individuals in society, and they're born in that class, the upper class of lords. And guess what? <laughs> if you're a lord, you're always a lord. Basically, it becomes your standard operating procedure. You are an important person. I don't want to say that all British lords are stuck in a holding up pattern, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were. Now, if there are any lords here among the participants, please raise your hand and I would love to see your body alignment and maybe stand correct. Now, does it have any benefits? Well, yeah. Are there any benefits to being self-confident? You betcha. Of course, self-confidence on the verge of arrogance may also come with a lot of negative, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to deal with the arrogant prick. Um, so basically there are pros and cons to everything. And holding up pattern may also help you achieve certain things. For example, lifting things up. If you hold up, it's a lot easier to lift things because your spine is not going to break. What's an alternative? Well, holding down is the reversal of holding up. It's kind of like being kind of slouched and uh, hanging the head low. Pelvis also is tucked in such a way uh, they call it tucking tailbone. A terrible suggestion that a lot of Tai Chi teachers give to their students. Tucking the tailbone will mess you up. And if you tuck the tailbone and try to lift something, you're probably going to hurt yourself. That's one of the main reasons why people have lower back pain. They tuck their tailbones too much, or they have too much tension in their abs and hamstrings. Both those muscle groups pull the pelvis out of alignment in this way. Like if I tense up my hamstrings, the long head of the hamstring attaches to the sits bone and it will tuck my tailbone. And the abs, that uh, uh, connect the pubic bone to the sternum when they contract also will tilt the pelvis in the same direction. Wow, okay, so that's how we tuck our tails. What's the benefit of that? Well, you may become more grounded. As a matter of fact, the person who holds down, the energy kind of sinks and they become more grounded. So I don't want to say that it should, should never be done. When, if you need to get grounded, tuck your tailbone and you will experience greater grounding. It doesn't mean that you will become more stable. So stabilization and grounding are two separate principles, but grounded you will become. Stable, not necessarily. However, should you always tuck, tuck your tailbone? I wouldn't do it. Why? Because it will not match the needs of other aspects of your life, other instances when you need to do something else. When your energy needs to go down, or for example, imagine you need to press down on something heavy, or let's say chop wood. Yeah, okay, when you're chopping wood, holding down would make sense because that's where your energy needs to go down. So to project energy in that direction, holding down would serve you well. But as soon as you stop chopping wood or pressing downwards, please snap out of it. 
<laughs> because getting stuck in that holding down is going to mess with many other parts of your life. It will cause low back pain. It will cause difficulty breathing because, well, how easy is it to breathe when the abs are tense and you're slouched? It will cause the pain in the neck, that proverbial pain in the neck that uh, other people often put fingers at others and say, oh, he is a pain in my neck. Well, in most cases, it's not somebody doing it to you, you are doing it to yourself. And we also learned that we can shift from holding up to holding down. And when we do this, something really interesting happens. At a certain instance, we get into the neutral. So let me demonstrate. <clears throat> I am going to hold up for a moment. Like being really proud, you know, like the Marines. The US Marines, they're the few, they're proud, they hold up. It's their job description. Once the Marine, you're always the Marine. So you basically get stuck in that holding pattern, which is rather unfortunate. Now, it may work your, uh, really well in your job. For example, you know, Marines, for example, often uh, serve as guards uh, for dignitaries. Uh, they serve as guards at the US embassies uh, around the world and so on. <clears throat> yeah, when you are the guard and you're standing, really solid and strong and proud, maybe that's what uh, you need to be doing. But once you get off of your post, <laughs> you don't have to be stuck in that same postural alignment. Unfortunately, most people do get stuck and they basically end up living their lives in the same holding pattern. So if I'm in a holding up position, I can slowly start getting out of it. How do I do it? Because I consciously got into holding up, I can consciously stop doing it. If I was doing it unconsciously, I wouldn't be able to stop doing it so easily. But since it's a conscious action, I can consciously release this tension and get to a more or less neutral state. Then from here, I can go into holding down. Again, there are some reasons to be this way. Or maybe you grew up in a family or in a community of people who are all like this. And there are some communities and nationalities where people have tendency to hold down. I'm not gonna point fingers, but you probably met some people from some parts of the world that have tendency to be this way. Okay. Since I did it to myself, I can also stop doing it. So I slowly snap out of it and come back to neutral. <sighs> and I have authentic sigh of release because I am no longer holding the tension. So my breathing confirmed to me that I am back to neutral. For example, if I want to hold forth, holding forth is another peculiar state of physical tension. It also goes hand in hand with psychological tension. Have you ever met anyone who's like this? Ready to pounce? Is it ready to fight? Maybe just really angry or pushy or angry or, or, or aggressive? Yeah, there are people who live that their entire lives in this state. Maybe under some circumstances, it's appropriate to be aggressive. Maybe sometimes anger is an appropriate emotional state too. But if you get stuck in that state, that's gonna mess your life up. Nobody wants to be with you. Nobody wants to be friends. And it's hard to communicate with people in a harmonious way if you're in that angry or pushy state. Sometimes people think, well, pushy sometimes is good you now for example i'm used car salesman let's say i'm i'm gonna be a little pushy because i want my customers to buy my cars fine if you are a used car salesman maybe you need to be this way but don't forget to get out of this state once you come back home 
otherwise you will be creating a lot of strife and, and uh, uh, dis uh, dysfunctional relationships in your family. Does it make sense? Now, what's the alternative to holding forth? Well, it's holding back. Holding back is direct opposite of holding forth. Instead of being like this, with weight on the toes, with tension in the calves, with tension in the buttocks and lower back, and mid back, pulling shoulders back, and also tension in the back of the neck because the head is kind of jutting forward. Holding back is associated with the reversal of this tension. So let me snap out of holding forth, go to neutral. And now I'm going to hold back. Now, to achieve this, I go onto my heels, shift the weight onto my heels. Of course, it requires tension in the shins because otherwise I will pull over backwards. It also requires tension in the thighs and abs because the body basically is kind of slanted backwards. The chest muscles, the pecs, are pulling the shoulders forward. And the head is actually leaning back a little bit with a fair amount of tension in the throat, muscles, the platysmus, and others. And so that creates the condition of holding back. Now, why do people do this? Looks like an uncomfortable way to be. Why would anyone do this to themselves? What do you think? Any ideas? Holding back is something that people do when they don't want to engage in certain interaction or in, in, they don't want to take advantage of certain opportunity because they may think that this is not a beneficial opportunity for them. They may hold back for some other reasons. For example, somebody says something nasty to you instead of just reacting and, and uh, saying something nasty back, they may hold back like, oh, wow, that was kind of mean, all right. So in other words, there is certain judgment associated with holding back. There is a certain degree of disconnect or um, disavowal. that You may feel like disgruntled or maybe even disappointed in something. Jokingly, I say, if you want to get into holding back pattern, just imagine somebody is giving you a bowl full of worms to eat. And you'll be like, oh, what is this? Well, that's exactly holding back. <laughs> Now, momentarily expressing that state of consciousness through body language would be completely appropriate under these circumstances. Unfortunately, a lot of people get stuck and live the rest of their lives in this holding pattern. I don't want to say that they always live in the holding pattern like this. Sometimes they flip-flop, for example, going from holding forth to holding back. Have you ever met anyone? who goes through love-hate relationships. Hmm, <laughs> that would be an example of that. And there are plenty of other examples of flip-flopping. You know, uh, for instance, uh, uh, manic depressive, so-called bipolar. Manic, you know, really active, really excitable versus depressive. <sighs> holding up and holding down. Now, when the person flip-flops without knowing what the neutral state is, they kind of skip the neutral or move through it so fast they don't notice, then they don't experience the benefit of being in that neutral state. But the more we go back and forth consciously, the more we recognize, oh yeah, this is the neutral state in between where I can actually rest, where I'm relaxed, my breathing is natural, my body is not hurting, I'm not in pain. Well, that would be a clear indication that you found something precious. <laughs> you found the state of neutral. Neutral not necessarily mean that it's habitual for you. Some people say, what's the difference between neutral and natural? Well, authentic natural would be neutral. However, for most people, what they're used to Neutral is not what, habitual. So they may feel like this is not natural for me to be this way. I'm always like this. 
Okay, well, how is it working for you? If it's not natural, that means you basically habituated yourself to be in a certain holding pattern that requires a lot of effort, a lot of energy, and actually causes you more grief and causes more suffering to people around you. So if you realize how you are often at the cause of your own suffering, well, you may actually get a handle on that exact issue. And some people realize that, wow, I don't need to keep suffering. I can do something else instead. In other words, suffering is optional. And what we discover for ourselves is that even pain is not a problem. Even when we experience pain, it's still something that we can benefit from instead of trying to suppress, kill it, or get rid of it. Now, I will have a separate Qigong coaching session specifically dedicated to working with pain and with the pain body. This term is pioneered and promoted by Eckhart Tolle, the author of several books, such as The Power of Now. He talked about the pain body uh, in his books, but he doesn't really go into how to work with the pain body. And I know him personally, and, and he doesn't want to really work with people one-on-one -on -one or in any other capacity like this. So basically, I just picked up right where Eckhart Tolle left off and developed a new modality of healing called pain body healing. So I will introduce that in our next Qigong coaching clinic. But before we wrap up today, I wanted to save some time for a person or two to receive a miniature coaching session. So whenever you're ready, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to receive a coaching session and speak up. And I will be happy to spend some time working with you and helping you as much as I can. I see Jackie raising your hand. Can you unmute yourself, Jackie? Ah, you don't know how. Um, yeah, there is uh, maybe your microphone. If you go to uh, Zoom preferences and check the uh, audio, maybe your audio is on some other microphone instead of build on mic. So that would be probably the simplest explanation of what's going on with your microphone. Well, while she's doing that, let's see if anyone else would like to receive a miniature coaching session. I see Brad lifted, uh, raised his hand. Brad, feel free to unmute yourself. I would be happy to help you out. Hey there. Um, hey, I really uh, resonate with the holding patterns thing and um, that it is unconscious. It did serve me in some times in my life, but it has become a perspective. And so that awareness is great. I'm awareness, but I like what you're saying about don't just create an equal and opposite tension trying to correct it. So what, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. And the answer is paradoxical, just like most things that I do. <laughs> we actually exaggerate it first. How do you exaggerate your existing holding pattern? Well, basically by doing more of that which you're already doing. So if you exaggerate your holding pattern, not a lot, just maybe by 15, 20%, what would it look like? Very nice. So you did it consciously. And conscious tension is something that your body will only tolerate for a relatively short amount of time. You see, you've been doing it unconsciously for a long time, and you probably keep doing it for years and decades. But if you do it consciously, your body will really get sick and tired of doing it, especially if you exaggerate it a little bit further. Yeah, and so as you do it, as you do it consciously now, please take a minute or two. Usually it doesn't take much longer than that. And then tell me when you get really sick and tired of doing it. And when you become really tired of doing it, then we will slowly start moving back out of this 
holding pattern. But not until you really are sick and tired of holding yourself this way. In a sense, you're connecting also with that aspect of consciousness associated with this holding pattern. You may become aware or cognizant of certain emotional states that cause you to do this. You may become aware of a certain habitual state of mind facilitating this holding pattern. That's okay. It's good to know that they exist. They can serve you as potential resources, potential tools in the future. It's just, we will put them in the right place. They're not all that you are. They're just tools that you can tap and resources that you can use when necessary. Very nice. Yeah. And as you're doing this, we're watching your breath. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for your breathing to basically say, I, I really can't do this anymore. And as your body starts releasing this tension, your breathing will open up. You may have a, a sigh of relief or you may start yawning, which is a perfect indication that you're entering an altered state. Most people don't consider yawning a really valuable tool. It's not like a breathing technique for most people, but it actually is a fantastic breathing technique that begins with contraction of the muscles on the inhalation and then relaxation as you exhale. And so that may be something that you will experience or maybe you'll just have a, a more subtle shift in your breathing pattern. And just let me know when you start noticing. Yeah, my breathing is slowed and a lot, the tension in my shoulders and abs and my hips, which I wasn't aware of, have just released on their own. It just kind of felt silly. Like, why am I doing this? However, my solar plexus hasn't changed. It's still real tight there. Yeah, so just hold for a little bit longer. It's not going to take very long. 30 seconds, maybe a minute, and you will be free of that tension. It's amazing. Most people think, well, if you have tension, you need to get rid of it. And when they hear me saying something silly, like, well, you need to exaggerate it first. They are incredulous. They're like, why would you want to do that? Well, because it works. I've been doing this work for over 30 years. And this is how I've helped thousands of people, literally thousands of people have released their tensions and became much freer in their bodies and their minds. Well, wouldn't you want it for yourself? And so only when you feel like you're really sick and tired of holding yourself this way, Brad, feel free to slowly start releasing the tension in your, in your abs and solar plexus, but not before you're ready. Other areas continue to release that I wasn't aware of. It's so interesting. That's fantastic. Yeah, you look like you're entering a slightly altered state. I don't know, maybe even your eyes will start watering. So if that's feel, happening, that's normal. I feel like tears in my face, like. That's what I mean. It's, yeah. it's easy to get into emotional state associated with the holding pattern because you're basically exaggerating the bodily expression that goes hand in hand with an emotional state. And so like we were talking about the chicken out of the egg, yeah, the body can affect emotions and mental states. We try to use the mental states first in most cases, but in this case, we started with the body, totally fine. And it may actually affect some emotional release. There's nothing wrong with that. There's a little release in the solar plexus, but nowhere near sick and tired of it. Well, it may take you longer yeah. than most people. Yeah, it feels kind of like. Exaggerate enough. 
<laughs> so uh, with your yeah. fingers, you can actually touch your solar plexus and play with it a little bit. See if you feel how harder it gets when you tense it up more. You feel the hardness? Yeah. Nice. And you can play with the degree of hardness of the solar plexus that you feel with your fingertips. Like, no, oh, it's still keeping the fingertips right there, please. Yeah, and you can play with that by tensing in a little bit more and a little bit less. And your fingertips will also provide you extra feedback tool or feedback loop. Yeah, that helped. I was just contracting, folding, but I wasn't pressing out with it. That, that really activated it. Nice. Uh-huh. Now I detect release. There. Yeah. And with the fingers still on your solar plexus, see how you can apply gentle pressure upwards so that you allow the sternum to lift away from the pubic bone. It may feel like, wow, I'm not used to this position of my chest. That's okay. You're not pressing too hard, just gentle pressure, maybe just a couple of pounds of pressure upwards. And you're simply enabling a more uh, facilitated kind of release of tension in your abs. Is it easier to breathe now? Yeah. <laughs> now oh. Whenever you're ready to let go of your solar plexus, feel free to do that. And yeah, you can also play with your shoulders just to check if there is any residual tension in your shoulders. If one shoulder is more tense than the other, again, you can tense it up. And for example, if there is more tension in my right shoulder, like in trapezius, like your right shoulder seems a little bit more elevated than the left. Yeah, you can bring the left hand on top of the right shoulder and actually press down with it while you're trying to lift the shoulder up towards your ear. So in a sense, again, you are contracting that muscle that you were unconsciously holding and just hold it for maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Again, doing it consciously will make you feel really sick and tired of holding this tension. And you will be ready to let it go. But don't let it go until you're really ready to. So in a sense, what we're doing is we're kind of speeding up the process of recognition of what we're doing to ourselves and also recognition that it's not really beneficial for me. Maybe at some point it worked, but no longer necessary. And so we let go of that, which is no longer asserting. That's it. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, again, tension is frozen movement. When tension subsides or thaws out, so to speak, often movement will erupt. Uh, the part of the body will feel like moving spontaneously or dancing even. And you just allow the shoulders and other parts of the body to express their freedom through movement. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Now that's the yawn that I was talking about. Yeah. Often people are self-conscious about yawning. For whatever reason, they have to apologize for yawning like they're doing something wrong or covering their mouths or even clenching their jaws, like pretending they don't have to yawn, giving themselves TMJ, of course. <laughs> yeah, yawning is an awesome meditative breath also because in the moment of yawn, there is a certain point in time when your mind can think. You literally flip the switch, like press the reset button in your mind. Did you notice that there was a certain moment in time your mind just can't think, goes blank? Perfect. Yeah. That is an excellent meditative state that a lot of meditators would kill for, metaphorically perhaps. <laughs> a lot of meditators spend a tremendous amount of time trying to get into this state. You know, I know plenty of people who meditate for hours, maybe one or two or even longer hours every day. They don't get into meditative state in the beginning of a meditation session. 
No, <laughs> they're usually uh, lucky if they get into it by the end of the meditation session and then it's over. What we do is we use this breathing technique called yawning to press the reset button in the mind and get into that meditative state without any ado, without sitting for hours. It's so simple and easy, it's almost illegal. <sighs> Wonderful. Well, how do you feel, Brad? Wow, it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's all the spots we isolated, it's more than that. Um, now I need to, I'm going to spend more time on the other side because I'm unbalanced. I just feel so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah and you're, you're definitely going to want to create more balance because otherwise one side of the body will be envious of the other side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and if you need my help with that, uh, you and anyone else attending our event today, I uh, invite you to book a complimentary coaching session. Of course, some of you have already worked with me, so please don't abuse me. <laughs> um, I do offer a complimentary coaching session to those of you who have not worked with me yet. And I would be happy to offer you an opportunity to receive a session with me at no charge. I normally charge $250 per session. It's gonna be a gift from me to you just for participating in our events for paying attention to what I'm teaching and improving the quality of your life. Now I see Mary, uh, sorry, Marcy Lindquist. Uh, uh, you either um, put a check mark or some, or wanted to raise your hand. I'm not sure yes. which one. Feel free to yes. unmute yourself and, and speak up. Yes. Uh, uh, am I unmuted? Yes, you are um, unmuted. However, um, I can't see you. Okay. Feel free to turn the video on so I can see. I don't know how to do that. On the bottom left corner, are you on a computer or? Oh, I see. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh. Yes. Good to see you, Marcy. I, I have two questions. Two. One, one question is, can you describe the out holding pattern? Yes, I can. <laughs> it begins usually with the uh, uneven distribution of weight between the right and left foot. Huh. And whichever foot is pointing more forward is more capable of carrying your weight. The foot that is more splayed out is less capable. That's the principle of stabilization. If you want to stabilize yourself, bring the alignment of bring your center line in alignment with the toes of the weight bearing foot and you will become much more stable it's just like ice skating for example and trust me i know a bit of, about ice skating and i also worked with ice skaters of world class uh, uh, two of my coaching clients are, are actually world champions in ice skating and so uh, when you align your center line with a, a weight bearing foot imagine you're on a skate you will be very stable even though you're balancing on this thin blade of metal. Now, if you turn your center line away from that skate or away from the weight bearing foot, it will become exceedingly hard to maintain stability, but you may actually orient your center line towards the opposite foot at the same time. And so then your weight will naturally shift towards the opposite foot. So whichever foot is in alignment or in more alignment with the center line, <clears throat> will be more capable of carrying your weight. Therefore, you will have uneven distribution of weight. Fine. Now, what happens to the hips? Well, the weight-bearing foot is also associated with a higher hip. So when you shift the weight on one side, on one leg, that respective hip will hike up. Almost always. <clears throat> if one hip is higher than the other, the pelvis is not level. Obviously, the pelvis is tilted away from the weight-bearing side. The sacrum, which is part of the pelvis, is tilted too. But since the sacrum is also the foundation of the spine, the lumbar spine will be tilted <clears throat> in the same direction, away from the weight-bearing foot. But you would fall over sideways if your entire spine was slanted like that. So your body compensates by tilting thoracic spine 
towards the weight-bearing foot, basically contracting the muscles obliques and QLs on the weight-bearing side and raising the opposite shoulder. So the non-weight-bearing side shoulder often will be higher, often will be tension and or pain in the deltoids on the uh, non-weight-bearing non side. <clears throat> the trapezius may also be more tense. And the neck often will try to bring the head into a more or less vertical position, although sometimes overcompensating, basically creating more of a scoliotic S-curve. Wow. Did I describe it sufficiently in oh, detail? Thank you very much. You're welcome. It, my, my second question relates to a good friend who wakes up multiple times during the night with severe cramping in his calves and feet. Mm -hmm. And is there a sleeping position or something that you, you think might be really off? Yes. Uh, well, what I do when I sleep is actually something really simple. I tuck the sheet or uh, blanket under my heels in such a way that uh, the feet are kind of slightly extended up, uh, sorry, no, um, uh, dorsiflex. So basically they're uh, pointing more upwards. The toes are not pointing away from the knees, they're actually more upwards. And that, if I'm sleeping on my back, so that creates a, a situation where the calves are not gonna be as likely to cramp up. Another thing that also helps a great deal is to put a pillow or a bolster under the knees. The anatomical position of the knees ideally would be slightly bent. Not a lot, but not straight locked position of the knees either. And when sleeping on a flat mattress, obviously knees would tend to straighten up completely. But if uh, your friend puts a pillow or a bolster under the knees to kind of just slightly bend them and leave them that way, that will also help. The is the pillow between the knees? No, under the knee. Between under the, the knee. Under the knee. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like, if, have you ever received a massage? Okay. Okay. He gave me a message. He said, it's not the feet and calf, it's the thighs and calf. Okay. Um, so there may also be uh, specific uh, reasons why his thighs and calves are tensing up. He may also be lacking potassium in his system, often uh, imbalance between that, uh, 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 sorry, uh, natrium chloride, uh, also known as uh, table salt. Uh, so uh, basically sodium and potassium, they need to be in balance because they both facilitate the uh, signals from central nervous system to muscle fibers. And if there is too much sodium in his system and not enough potassium, there is imbalance. And basically uh, one of the easy ways to mitigate that is by eating some bananas, the source of potassium. And also less stable salt. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And if your friend needs my help, feel free to uh, tell him that he is welcome to contact me directly. As a matter of fact, here in the, in the chat, I'm going to give you guys a link uh, to a website where you can just book an appointment with me for free. Like I said, it's a, a gift that I wanted to offer to you because I appreciate your interest in my work. I want to be of help to you. And also many people who received a complimentary session say, well, that was awesome, I want more. And they sign up to work with me as their Qigong coach. So here is the link that um, uh, I want to share with everyone. 
here it is. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, um, maybe it needs to be HTTP in front. I don't know. Let's try this. Oh, now it works. Great. Thank you so much, Marcy. Do you have any questions or do I, uh, did I answer your questions? Yes, I appreciate it very much. You're so welcome. All right. And uh, also somebody said, uh, the person needs more magnesium. Yes, RF suggested the magnesium. Oh yeah, magnesium uh, also helps muscle relax. That's why people take magnesium baths. So yeah, that is, might be a, a fine thing to consider. Um, a by available source of magnesium might also help with cramping. Yes, Elena is uh, my coaching client and she knows what she's talking about. Thank you so much, Elena, for doing that. Uh, that is a, a, a good suggestion as well. We are not gonna just throw darts and see what's gonna stick because I don't know your friend. I would love to be able to work with him more directly so that we can actually uncover the root cause of his cramping rather than just me trying to conjure up some answers. Excellent. All right, well, thank you so much. Now, anyone else would like to raise the hand and uh, ask any other questions I'm on the roll. So I'm happy to answer another question or work with another person. Feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and speak up. Well, if there are no more questions, that's perfectly fine. Um, Oh, there is somebody posted something. Um, Bill Jackson said, thank you, Lama, for a most informative presentation. You're welcome, Bill. Maybe all breathe with loving chi towards everything, said Brenda. Yes, Brenda, you are absolutely right. Breathing with loving chi is the way that we normally breathe, but it's definitely a fine thing to do right now. I see Arif also uh, unmuted himself. Feel free to speak up, Arif. Yes, hi. Uh, and first of all, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I have a, a severe scoliosis and I'm, I'm treating it aggressively. And I was wondering if you wanted to suggest some qigong that I can do to um, accompany that with. One suggested to me bone breathing. So I do that sometimes, but I'm wondering if there's more, uh, <clears throat> more movements that I can do. Well, absolutely. Well, first of all, you need to address the root causes of scoliosis. Just trying to do movements um, often will be um, met with the resistance of the body. And so you will be unconsciously compensating for that resistance. And that is going to add insult to injury. So addressing the root causes of what causes the scoliosis may be a wise thing to do. Have you ever experienced any severe trauma such as car accident? Uh, I know what caused the scoliosis. It was during my birth. So uh, that was the trauma. Okay, what happened during your birth? I, I was uh, taken out with forceps. And uh, that created damage? Uh, apparently, <laughs> that, yeah. Well, not necessarily, uh, plenty of children. No, 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 I, that's very definitely, that's very definitely what it was because I had it since my childhood, since my early childhood. I see. Well, so I would certainly be happy to work with you on this issue Obviously, it's been an, an ongoing, long-standing issue as old as you are. So mm -hmm. that is definitely not going to be possible to resolve in a matter of a few minutes in the context yeah, sure. of a, a, a short coaching that I can do here in, in our coaching clinic. But please feel free to click the link I just shared in the chat. Book a, a complimentary session with me. I'm not going to charge you anything for it. And we'll see what we can do. And if you feel like my approach is the right approach for you, I would love to continue working with you as your Qigong coach. And that's something that will, if not completely remove scoliosis, at least develop a, a much more intelligent way for you to address the scoliosis on a deep fundamental level and potentially develop ways to mitigate it. Mitigation of scoliosis is obviously a second best choice after complete removal of it, 
I'm not going to make promises that we will just eradicate your scoliosis, okay. but mitigating it is definitely something we do, and I would be happy to help you with that. Okay, thank you very much. You are so welcome. All right. Well, to wrap up, I want to again express my appreciation of you taking your time to hang out with me today to learn a few things. And uh, I also want to implore you to pay attention to your body alignments. First, just taking natural stance, jumping and landing softly and learning to pay attention to distribution of weight on your feet. Is there too much weight on one foot, much more than on the other? Is there too much weight on your heels or on the toes? Is there too much weight on the medial or lateral sides of your feet? All of this will essentially affect how the rest of your body is doing. And if you need any help with that, you are welcome to book a session with me. I will be happy to help you. If not myself, uh, last week or uh, two weeks ago, I offered this and 30 people signed up. So <laughs> I had to distribute some of the sessions among my pro uh, apprentices. Some of the apprentices are here. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, in our future coaching clinics, perhaps I will also invite my apprentices to be more proactive and maybe uh, take over some of these uh, uh, little, uh, little sessions that we do within a coaching clinic, but um, I will do everything in my powers to help you. And I look forward to seeing you very soon. Namaste.